Hello everyone. I am so excited to welcome you to this Arm Vision Day panel discussion which is about innovation at the intersection of hardware and software. I am Priyanka Sharma and I'm the general manager of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation or the CNCF as it's affectionately known. Many of you may have heard of our portfolio projects such as Kubernetes, Prometheus, Envoy, Fluentd. The list is actually quite long because today we host 85 projects and the list keeps growing. I am very honored to be here today to interview a highly established set of luminaries from the tech industry to talk about the intersection of hardware and software today. Um, so folks, welcome to this panel. Thank you so much for joining me. And why don't we do a quick round of introductions about yourself, where you work, and any other tidbits you might want to share. I'll start, I'll say, let's start with Alex. Hi, uh, my name is Alexander Hitzinger. I'm the CEO of Artemis. Uh, in this automotive tech company, we create new methods and tools which allow us to develop and optimize complex systems faster and better. This will enable the VW Group uh, and its brands to reduce time to market and improve the user experience. Michael, you're next. Oh, my, my pleasure. So Mike Ellis, uh, I'm the Chief Customer and Digital Officer of Johnson Controls. Johnson Controls is the largest uh, intelligent buildings company in the world. And uh, this is a topic that's uh, close to mind for us. Awesome, Henry, do you wanna go next? Sure. Hi, my name is Henry Sanders. I am uh, CVP and CTO for Azure Edge uh, platforms that covers operating systems, including uh, Windows and our Linux efforts. Uh, a lot of my focus these days is on the hardware software intersection at the lower layers of the stack. I've been at Microsoft um, a long time, uh, more than 30 years now, and I have uh, been all over the stack. Recently, I'm focusing a lot in that area, and so I'm super excited to hear what other people have to say. My name is Vicki Mitchell, and I'm a Vice President of Engineering for ARM's uh, Systems Group. The uh, Systems Group uh, produces IP uh, that enables our partners to create SOCs based on ARM's processors. Personally, I'm super excited to be here because my background is in embedded systems. I've experienced firsthand some of the challenges in terms of hardware software co-development that I really think that the ARM V9 ar architecture attempts to challenge. So. It's awesome to meet you here. It's a great system. Thanks, I'm happy to be here. Awesome, next up, William. Hi, hi everybody. My name is William Wei. Uh, I'm the CEO, CTO of Foxcom Group. As you all know, Foxcom is the largest uh, contract manufacturer in the world in a global scale. Um, Foxcom was famous for um, you know, making for iPhone <laughs> manufacturing. I'm I'm sitting in just because uh, uh, Arm just uh, participate in one of our uh, initiative, which is called MI Edge. Um, it it is a uh, open EV, open EV uh, electrical uh, vehicle, open platform. Uh, so it was announced. This initiative was announced. Uh, last year of uh, October. So if, if, if you uh, think of uh, Tesla as the iPhone of EV, uh, we want to be the open, you know, open platform, the Android of EV. It's a, it's a full stack of software stack and then hardware stack together with connected vehicle as a whole. So to, to put it simple as that, it's a, it's going to be a connected uh, computer running on the road. That's a reference design. And we're going to produce a different reference design, just like what Android will be. And uh, we'll see what happens. So folks, thank you so much for introducing yourselves. As I said, this panel is full of luminaries, so very exciting. I'd like to ask you all, why should we be thinking about the intersection of hardware and software today? Why should we be thinking about edge? And perhaps Mike, since you build smart buildings, you can get us started. Sure, sure, no, it's a great question. You know, um, the, the combination, the bringing together of the best of what software can deliver and what hardware can deliver, and also affecting the whole development and design cycle in a different way, I think is is right at our fingertips as as uh, technology industry and and of course in our space around buildings, 
you know, we, we uh, you know, we're a hundred year plus uh, old company. And so we've got electromechanical core platforms that run everything about a building, you know, be it uh, cooling and heating and security and all those platforms. Uh, with that population comes also, you know, probably the, the broadest depth of sensors in the building. So the opportunity now to, to start to connect all of those elements and inform the design and architecture process of a, you know, the software defined hardware view of how do you actually uh, create really interesting business value out of not only the insights that you might be able to gain by connecting all those things, but also providing different operating capabilities within that building. Using technology where it should be used and doing compute and AI and intelligence where it should be used as opposed to a prescribed view uh, of architecture is really important. So it was a long way of saying edge is really important for us. Um, I'd like to ask you this, Henry, what do you think are the main issues that have traditionally stood in the way of hardware and software development happening more cohesively? Because it sounds like we need to start doing that stat. Yeah, you know, I think there's a few issues uh, that have uh, been a problem here. One is just timelines. Hardware and software uh, work on substantially different timelines. Three years in a silicon project doesn't necessarily seem very long. Three years in a software and world seems like forever. So meshing up the timelines, coming to a unified vision around uh, where we should be going jointly, I think is an impediment. I think some of that is becoming more clear. And you know, I'll, I'll think I'll echo something Mike said earlier around AI being a driving force for a lot of that. I think that is sort of uh, bringing a lot of innovative thought into how uh, AI and uh, hardware accelerators and software can work together, both on training and inference. Um, another thing I think sometimes is I think it's very difficult to find a single company that does hardware and software both well, um, and that requires partnerships across the ecosystem. I think ARM does a really valuable thing here in terms of I was gonna um, say. <laughs> uh, creating an ecosystem uh, that's open enough that people can actually innovate and bring people together in a fashion and, uh, and be able to encourage some of that. Uh, thanks for bringing that up, Henry. That's actually a really good point. Um, I. You know, I was I was thinking about this as we were uh, getting ready for our panel today, and and thinking about how things have changed over time, right? You know, we as a software engineer myself, my background, uh, we always complain about when the hardware was available, and uh, you know, and how could we make the hardware available uh, more readily, you know, and and quicker in the design process, and that's you know that's really. That's something that we've started addressing in the industry. We started addressing this years ago, right, with the advent of uh, virtual platforms and things like ARMS Fast models and the like, where we could virtualize the hardware and develop on that. And I think right now we're, we're at the sort of the next level, right, where we take those virtual platforms um, and those models and we put that up in the cloud and we, and we look at it holistically, right? So you have the whole system in front of you, everything that you're trying to do, where, where you're gonna put your particular requirements, where you're gonna emphasize performance. And if you can do all of that and do it so much quicker than we've done in the past with you know, waiting for the hardware to be designed, waiting for the software to be developed, it's really a game changer in terms of, of, of unlocking innovation. And that's one of the things that I think is so exciting about some of the initiatives that ARM has going on right now is this, you know, encapsulating that understanding of, of hardware and software working together. Decisions that you've, you know, you've tried to anticipate in the past, some of the, some of the trade-off decisions, right? Like where workloads are going to go, especially if you have a heterogeneous compute environment. In the past, we've like, you know, we've relied heavily on our brilliant architects, right, to say, okay, well, this is going to go on the general purpose compute, and this part is going to go in, you know, in a DSP, in a digital, digital signal processor, et cetera. But now you can actually experiment with those trade-offs, and you can go, I get a better power profile if I do, you know, this particular processing in the cloud. I get a better power profile if I do this particular processing in a uh, you know a dedicated custom hardware accelerator, and a fine example of that is what we're talking about with this edge AI, right? Where you can you know you can uh, evaluate how your system performs for the training cycles versus versus the inference cycles, and you can make decisions about you know how much inference you're going to do 
at the edge, how much training you're going to do at the edge. I think it really just unlocks that potential to, for you to experiment and to optimize long before your hardware designs are complete. You know, you mentioned uh, heterogeneous compute. I think that's a super fascinating area, uh, the ability to dynamically move workloads around to where they're best suited to run at that one point in time or to self-aggregate devices and sensors into a bigger sort of compute resource or sensor resource, I think is a real uh, game changer going forward. I think key to a lot of this is going to be maintaining open interfaces between hardware and software, hardware in particular. It can be very difficult if you start getting lots of proprietary uh, interfaces in the place here. So I think that's a super interesting thing to keep an eye on and to sort of understand you know, how you might be able to take uh, different hardware pieces that run, you know, different ISAs, different sensor models, but can interconnect in standard fashions and be able to aggregate them into an overall computing resource could be a real step forward for all of us. I'd love, Alexander, if you could share your thoughts of with all the diversity of edge and then all the options available as Vicky was sharing on what kinds of uh, compute you want to use, et cetera. What do you think, uh, do you think there is a need or space for maybe purpose-built silicon um, as we go into the edge? Is that an advantage or do we need to worry about it? So purpose-built uh, silicon uh, obviously has uh, the big advantage uh, of that you don't have to make the big compromises. Uh, you know, you can optimize uh, your silicon exactly for your application. Uh, and you avoid these compromises, you have to take uh, with off-the-shelf silicon. However, it also uh, comes with extremely high cost and, uh, and, and, and also a lot of risk. Because I mean, if you take the example of autonomous vehicles, right, uh, nobody really knows yet exactly what are the requirements, what are the specifications of uh, hardware acceleration and, and things like this. So if you embark now on a, on a custom silicon based on uh, assumptions, and uh, you know, we all know how expensive it is to develop custom silicon, uh, and you know, especially for high performance compute when we talk about seven nanometers, five nanometers, in the future, even three nanometers. It's a double-sided uh, sword, right? Uh, on one side, it, it brings big advantages. On the other side, it, it also uh, high cost and high risk. Edge is obviously playing an increasingly crucial role. How important do you think it is that Edge efforts embrace cloud-native principles? I'll let whoever wants to answer go for it. So if we take principles which have been established in the cloud and bring them into the edge, that will help to make give us flexibility and make that that the transfer uh, easier. And, and and obviously we should strive to get a, a standardization in the edge anyway in order to uh, you know, reduce dependencies on hardware suppliers, make make us more flexible, incre increase the development efficiency, and all these kind of things. The way I look at it, I'm coming from a long time uh, smartphone industry. For the development, uh, we always want to virtualize everything in the cloud or on the desktop. Uh, everything virtual. So you develop all the uh, software specification user experience all in um, kind of cloud native uh, fashion. So let really lower the uh, barrier entry for all the developer, right? And and when it's it's only when you are in the deployment architecture that you, you separate this. Okay, how much intel intelligent I want to put in the edge? How much in intelligent that I want to rely on the cloud? Depends on computation power and also the linking speed, right? So uh, at the end of the day, in deployment and architecture, is all about user experience. That makes sense. Uh, Mike, you were saying something too? For buildings, it's important to us from a safety and security standpoint, as an example, much like automobiles, that you do certain things in the building. You have to. You know, so fire as an example and fire sensors and those type of things. Security um, is a mix of both local as well as cloud-based processing capabilities. And so, um, you know, it's incumbent on us to be successful around intelligent buildings and how you deliver next, next generation, next class capabilities. That portability is kind of the word of the day. And, and not just from cloud to cloud, but actually from edge to cloud to, to whatever device. So I agree with, uh, with William that it all starts with the user experience, with the user journeys. And what is a good user experience? 
creates a good business, right? So that brings it then and and that user experience that creates certain requirements. And then the next step is that really system architecture. User experience, user requirements drive system architecture and a system consists of software and hardware. You don't need just software architects, you don't need just hardware architects. None of them will lead. We need a very unique skill set of system architects. And that is obviously a, 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 a rare skill and, and, uh, and unique. And, and these really then drive the, the development roadmaps, right? The product roadmaps. I don't know. I... I'm a software guy, so I feel obligated to say, of course, the software guy. Family. <laughs> it's um, all about software. <laughs> if, I look, if I look back, I think it's more complicated than that. And I almost perceive a bit of a, of a ping pong kind of effect. If you think uh, capacitive touch was a transformative technology, which I would say was largely hardware. Uh, there are definitely some software aspects to it, but it drove a ton of subsequent software innovation. There's a whole slew of things that were unlocked because of capacitive touch technologies. Uh, at the same time, I would say AI was largely a software technology that has driven a whole bunch of hardware innovation as people try and come up with various forms of accelerators and uh, inference engines and so forth. I, I think I like I, the the idea of sort of emerge the disciplines appeals, but I think it's difficult. I'm not really sure we are we are we are thinking about that in a um, deliberative enough fashion to actually make that happen. So I'm going to go with something like, yeah, you're probably going to see a bit of a balance, a bit of a back and forth uh, kind of uh, relationship between the two areas. I, I do actually think it's a blend of, of hardware and software engineering, hardware and software development. Um, it's, it's less of a partnership than sort of a merging of these, of these methods. And it's going to change the way that we introduce new products to the market. And I think so we've already seen this within ARM systems team where, um, and other groups within ARM where the hardware designers um, uh, you know, adapt methodologies that take advantage of methodologies that have been traditionally in the software space, things like agile design and, and DevOps practices and hardware design. The sort of merging of the mindset I think makes a lot of sense because you know, at the end of the day, what you're trying to do when you're introducing a new tech product is take an idea that you have in your head, right, and translate it into something that a computer can process, you know, whether that's, you know, program code or, you know, synthesis or something like that, and or, you know, deliver um, for the user experience, like the things that we do with artificial intelligence and machine learning and models on the edge and things like that. And so we we standardize that translation process with its expanding source for uh, support for these specialized workloads for supporting those specialized workloads. That's really the strength that um, ARM v9 architecture provides. And so you know I had to put that in there because this is all about v9. <laughs> but you know <laughs> that's what v9 does, right? It says, oh well, we now need to have this ability to do something different with compute. We need to be able to address that translation differently. And so we expand. Um, the architecture and support that new workload, and you still have the common platform and the common methodologies. Totally, totally. Well, folks, it sounds like the future is all yours. Thank you so much for joining me for this panel. I learned a lot. I am so pumped for Edge, Edge on Cloud Native, and all the work that's going to come out of uh, our respective organizations. Thank you so much for taking the time, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Very Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you.